Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Mucella Foundation's Brain Tumor Webinar Series. Tonight's topic is fighting GBMs, and the special guest speaker is Dr. Christopher Duma. He's the medical director of the Brain Tumor Program at Hogue Memorial Hospital Presbyterian in Newport Beach, California. Uh, Dr. Duma is a neurosurgeon. Take it away, Dr. Duma. All right, Al, thank you so much. You know, uh, it's great to be invited to do this and I really appreciate the opportunity and I thank the foundation for this opportunity. It's great to get my message out on glioblastoma and it really is all about fighting this disease. I've been around, we just found out, Al and I have just found out that uh, we've been around about the same time since 1993, I've been out practicing neurosurgery and one of the first things that I could not stand about my field was this crazy disease called glioblastoma. I mean, why have we been not having any success with treating this tumor over the years? Now, I didn't mind that 27 years ago when I started as a fresh, right out of training neurosurgeon, but for 27 more years, things haven't changed much at all. The only thing that's come around is Temodar, which is a great drug and it works. Um, and, you know, Optune, you know, the Tomo TTF, uh, obviously there have been many other clinical trials going on, things that are changing now, immunotherapy, but for all practical purposes, this, this, this tumor has evaded us. And I got to thinking about one aspect of this tumor as to why it evades us. And I thought about how it migrates, how it moves through the brain. There's no other disease that does that move, literally like a little amoeba moving through the brain. So what I'm gonna show you today is how I fight glioblastoma, how I would uh, hope that some of you all can benefit from this and show you some of the examples of what we've done over the years. So in front of you, you have a slide that I'm showing a normal brain. Now that, that is a normal, lovely young brain. Uh, glioblastoma, takes many, many forms, and here they are. So uh, in the middle here is a glioblastoma that's low bar. Here's the classic butterfly glioma. This is another low bar tumor, and this is what we call multifocal glioblastoma, but I'm gonna teach you all today that multifocal glioblastoma does not exist. It's all one tumor that just happens to sprout out bigger in certain areas and more aggressively. Um, so that's the first lesson, okay? When you see, when you look at a scan, most doctors are gonna show you the gadolinium scan, the, the scan where you get the contrast. And they actually judge all their, uh, you know, treatment effects based on this, to be honest with you. And this looks like a tumor that looks pretty bad, uh, seems to be isolated to the, you know, we look backwards on scans, everybody. So this is the right frontal lobe and the right insular cortex. Uh, and however, if you show a, a scan done on the same day in the same machine called the flare, you see that this tumor is everywhere, okay? It's not just in these areas here. So the problem is, is that you can treat this and focus on these areas. You can do surgery on this area all day long. I, I, I'm a surgeon. I can cut this cyst out over here and I can cut this area out over here. However, you still have everything that's migrated over to the other side of the brain and everything that's migrating backwards, et cetera. And as you can see, this would be a very, very dangerous surgical undertaking. Now, this has gotten into the news. Ted Kennedy had GBM, Bo Biden had GBM, John McCain had GBM. So we're all kind of used to seeing uh, this disease out in the real world. And, you know, you wonder, where, where do these guys get treated? What, what questionable, famous institutions were they treated? Well, I mean, nothing but the best. And to be quite honest with you, no one, none of them lived more than, say, I think 13, 14 months after diagnosis. And they were at the best institutions in the world. So we really have a, have a, a problem here. It, it, you know, it is... It is battling, it is battling GBM. And that is what we're gonna talk about today. But, but I come to it from a different perspective. Um, and this is, this is where we're gonna start. 
So you have to understand how glioblastoma migrates before you understand how to treat it in that fashion. So I, I, I use this knife and fork example. You can't cut this tumor out. Obviously, if you could cut this tumor out, we'd have a cure for it, right? So if, if you have a tumor that's the size of your fist, you cut out the fist, you should be able to cure it. Well, that's not the case with glioblastoma. And why? It's because of that first slide that I showed you as to how it takes over a very large volume of the brain without you seeing it, really. That's the advantage of the flare sequence. So when you all go to your doctors, you want to see the flare sequence as well as the gadolinium sequence, if they show you the scan at all. So this is the problem. You cannot cut this out. It's not surgically resectable tumor. Now, other tumors that we see in the brain, like meningiomas, or in the body, like a breast lump or a, or a lung cancer, you can cut those out. You can, they, they grow like snowballs. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Uh, if you have a meningioma in the brain, you can cut that out. You can get around it. And once you take it out, it's gone. That's kind of like this analogy. This is I, you know, I sought the internet for all these, these photos. Uh, this, is, this is a, you know, a jello mold that has numerous strawberries in it and is very similar to a, a brain that has multiple brain metastases from say melanoma or breast cancer or lung cancer. And that's literally what we can see on a scan. We can see multiple little cannonballs in there that we can truly take out or we can treat each one of those with gamma knife. In the case of glioblastoma, it's not an individual strawberry, it's the actual brain itself that has the tumor in it. So we're cutting out, if we're cutting out anything, we're cutting out brain that has the tumor in it, not a tumor that's pushing the brain aside. So that's a very distinct uh, difference between glioblastoma and other tumors. I mean, this is what separates it from these other tumors, and this is why it's so darn hard to to take out surgically and, and basically impossible. So if you get that understanding, then you understand that back in 1928, when Walter Dandy, one of the fathers of neurosurgery, found a patient with glioblastoma and cut the entire hemisphere out, that the patient still died of that disease because what Dr. Dandy didn't know, because he didn't have the flare sequence on his MRI, was that it had already crossed over to the other side of the brain and was ready to just keep on going on the other side of the brain. So this, this really led to a nihilistic approach to glioblastoma, all right? And quite frankly, it's somewhat appropriate, the nihilistic approach. It, I mean, we all know this 14.6 months median survival number. If you get this disease, that's the first thing you're looking at is you know, how long am I going to live? And it's not great. And it's definitely not great in today's world, in today's modern world. I mean, we're going to, up to, you know, the space station on SpaceX. You know, we should have a little bit more going on than this. And hopefully my contribution to this will add to all the other research that's going on and hopefully help you all too. So, you know, we've really, as I mentioned, not seen much go on recently. So let's, let's talk about what leading edge is, okay? So I call it treating the leading edge. And I think by now I'm pretty well known for this. I have a lot of people who send me their MRI films from all over the world. And I mean, Australia, the Middle East, uh, Africa, South Africa. I have patients from around the world sending me their scans, doctor, Am I a leading edge candidate? And to be quite honest with you, I have to turn away about 70% of them because the tumor is way too far advanced. It's, it's on the flare sequence, it's way too advanced. It's like that other picture that I showed you. So unfortunately, a lot of these patients, um, you know, they've been treated for one year, two years, they're doing pretty well, and now they have recurrence, but the Inversion recovery, that's what the flare is. The inversion, that's what IR at the end of flare stands for. The inversion recovery shows that tumor has really migrated uh, a, a, a lot of the volume of the brain. So in this case, let's take a look, okay? That is a leading edge because it's going across 
to the other side of the brain. Now this is the epicenter right here. That's your gadolinium contrast. And everybody just focuses on that. You know, we can surgically remove that and make it look real pretty, but that's not the problem. Here, going across the brain, here, going posterior in the brain, and look at that. That is way far away from this epicenter. I'll show you. That is a leading edge that's already gotten out farther than you'd even expect. And this is how it works. This is this tumor here. And then, believe it or not, that's how far out this thing has migrated. So these tumors are super smart. We have to out think them. And that's, that's been my experience. You know, I've actually been doing this leading edge thing for at least 20 years now. And it boggles my mind how I still can't beat the tumor and get rid of every one of these by catching it before it keeps on going. But I mean, it is, it ha we have made great strides. I'll show you. So this, this is like a patient I'd have to, um, I'd have to re reject. If the tumor started here, this is the flare, you can see that it's affecting the you know, temporal lobe and going back in the occipital lobe. But by the time I, I get to see their scan, now the tumor has spread pretty far. And now it's in the frontal lobe, it's in here, it's crossing, it's going into the midbrain. So we can't do anything for these patients, or I, excuse me, I can't do anything. This is the realm of you know, immunotherapy, the on neuro-oncologist, et cetera. We could never treat that, that, um, that volume. So you really have to understand that this is not insurmountable. This, these silly gliomas, they can travel through the brain, but you know what? They can't just cross certain highways. They have to take highways. And those are called the white matter tracks, okay? Everybody knows gray matter, white matter. It's the gray mat the, the, the white matter tracks that they can actually follow down. And I tell patients that it's kind of like the start of a marathon. Think of, think of a large New York City or Boston marathon, and there's hundreds, 500 people lined up at the starting line. And then as they start the race, as people are running, there's some that run faster, some that run slower, and eventually it tapers out, doesn't it? And just like this diagram shows the tapering out, there is one little cell out here that will create glioblastoma. So if you focus on the starting line or all those 500 people, you're not, and you don't take care of that one at the very end, the tumor's been migrated and it's, it, it's already making its way, wending its way through the brain. So remember my, um, my marathon analogy and how this tumor spreads. Now, how does the tumor spread? This is, this is gonna blow your mind it actually changes its, its phenotype. The phenotype is the way a tumor looks. So if this is a normal astrocyte, astrocyte are supporting cells in the brain, if it mutates into a glioblastoma cell, it actually changes shape and it looks like an amoeba. And you know why it changes shape? So it can actually move like an amoeba, like a, like a paramecium or an amoeba moving and and you know what it's done it actually has actin filaments actin or what are in your muscles is actin and myosin in your muscles everywhere in your body they contract and then it, it shoots out these what are called invadopodia little feet that invade as they move forward and they motor down the extracellular matrix of the white matter pathways and you know what's even crazier it actually develops a membrane anchor. So it moves like an inchworm. It pulls itself forward, anchors, pulls itself forward, anchors, pulls itself like an inchworm. And this is each individual cell. This isn't just you know, a few cells. This is how glioblastoma migrates through the brain. It's unbelievable. Okay, I don't know whether you guys can really fathom that, but that's the reason we have such a problem. And you know, the tumor can't just do this on its own. It has to develop ways of doing that, to break down the, the pathway, to make it easier for itself. And this is what it does. It develops a 
these MMPs. It actually shoots out this protein, which opens up the pathway so they can get through it faster. It's, it's incredible. The myelin, the myelin sheaths are very tight, but these tumors have figured out a way to make their way between the spaces of the myelin sheaths. It's unreal. Uh, adhesion molecules, they, they have to bind to certain extracellular matrix to actually be able to get that migration going. They have proteases that they secrete that degrades the proteins around it. Other proteins, tenacin C, it, it, it makes the motility faster. Um, and all sorts of things. I'm looking, I'm showing you all these different things that go on with a glioblastoma cell and have to be working for it to actually move. Now, if you take a glioma and you look at it under the microscope and you see this pattern over here, that's called pat, uh, palisading. So pseudo palisading or palisading. And you know what these are? These are tumor cells moving away from a dead center. So they've already done their damage in here. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're getting out of dodge because, oh, there isn't any more oxygen. There's nothing more to nourish me. So they're moving. When a pathologist sees this on the slide, he says, oh, it's a glioblastoma, boom. And they've done studies on this. If you put a, a tumor in normal oxygen, it, it kind of stays okay and it'll move, but slower. If you make the condition hypoxic, low oxygen, the tumor cells start moving like crazy. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. I mean, it, 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 it fascinates me, even after 27 years. This blows my mind. If you give a tumor cell a little bit of radiation, it migrates faster. This is the distance, 1.2 here is the distance away from the starting line, right? And it will move at this rate, 1.2 if you give just a little bit of radiation. And by the way, that's the same dose you get when you get six weeks of radiation therapy. You get two gray per day. If you give a high dose, like 30 gray or, or so, 20 gray, it slows it down. So it goes in reverse, they don't go in reverse, they slow down, okay? So you begin to wonder whether by giving little doses of radiation, we're causing tumor cells to migrate more. Don't, don't let me tell you to not have radiation therapy. I'm a big proponent of it because it doubles life expectancy. But these are the concepts that we look at when we're, you're looking at treating the leading edge. So in reality, you need some magic drug that'll inhibit MMP, tenacin C, integrins, downgrades, upgrades, does all sorts of things. Then we gotta put you in a hyperbaric chamber. But if we just radiated those leading edges, maybe they would stop growing, okay? So that's where I came about. Now, you guys all probably remember, not all of you, but I mean, the academicians among us, Back in 2004, there was an article that said, radio surgery does not help. Now, now you guys know what radio surgery is. It's not radiation therapy. Radio surgery is where we give one dose of radiation in one day, focused to a target area. And I'm gonna show you how I focus the radiation to the leading edges, okay? So this article, this, this very article here uh, stopped everybody from using radio surgery to treat glioblastomas, you know, except me, everybody except me. Uh, and the reason this stopped it was because they gave the radiation, the radio surgery to the enhancing area. Now you're all educated already. If you started from the beginning of this, this web webcast, um, that is not the, that is the epicenter of the tumor, but that's not where the tumor has already spread. But this, this article, this, this experimental group, just treated the epicenter and they ignored the leading edge of the tumor. So of course, the patients didn't do much better than if they had had this surgically removed. So there was a kibosh that was put on radiosurgery back in 2004 and for the longest time. 
I mean, there are still people that believe that this, you know, radio surgery should not be used for glioblastoma for this reason. They're just not aiming at the right spot. So basically, my, my hypothesis was failure of tumor control was failure to control the migration. Okay. Now, the oncologists among us are, you know, they have they do a fantastic job, but they're not they're not really focusing on migration. They're, lo they're looking more on cell turnover. They're looking at cell replication. They're, they want to do anything to kill the cell so it doesn't divide anymore. Immunotherapy is looking at direct kill of tumors. But you really got to kill them all. Otherwise, you know, we're at square one eventually. So that's why surgical debulking is ineffective. That's why some of our Chemotherapies are in, 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 you know, ineffective, et cetera. So I invented this term leading edge back in 95, and I actually got a United States patent for that. Um, in concept, what I'm doing is cutting it off, cutting the tumor's migration off of the pass, kind of like a fire break, right? I don't know whether you guys live in you know, these rural areas, but you know, they cut down trees in a fire break line so that if there were a fire over here devastating this side of the mountain, it wouldn't make its way to the other side of the mountain and it would actually stop, stop burning. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And do tumor cells act the same way? If you stop them, will they stop burning? And the answer is a resounding yes. So interestingly, part of the, the phenotype of a glioblastoma cell is that it actually has to do that moving to survive. If you stop it from moving, if you stop its motility, it will self-destruct, it will apoptose, it will auto-destruct. So that's pretty cool. So if we're able to stop where the tumor is, is mobilizing to, then maybe it will just self-destruct. And it's not gonna go backwards, people. It won't go backwards and keep on growing into a ball because it has nothing to nourish it. it has, it's going to places that add nourishment. And, and by the way, this is why I'm not a big fan of Avastin. What does Avastin do? Avastin cuts down the blood supply of the tumor. And so it can't get oxygen. So you're all brilliant, educated webinar people now. What does the tumor do when it has low oxygen? It moves faster away from where it started to seek oxygen. Um, so I'm not a big fan of Avastin. It makes tumors look very good on the scans, but I don't know whether it has any real major uh, effect on tumor survival. How, do we, how are we doing this? You know, when we radiate those leading edge pathways, Single shot, one day, one treatment. When we radiate that, what are we doing? Are we scarring the tumor's uh, pathway? Like, you know, making it more difficult for the tumor cells to get through? Are we just killing those very frontline tumor cells? Both, you know, I don't know. I don't know how this is working, but believe me, it works very, very well, and I'll show you the cases. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a patented, uh, technique back in uh, 20, what is that, 15? I gotta put my glasses on for that one. Yeah, 2015. And then it is all, also published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, my work, on 174 patients. So all of this is accessible to you. You can look up this journal. It's a free, it's a free paper. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. So it's open, open source uh, um, journal. So on, this, is a, this is an example of treating a tumor with gamma knife uh, or with radio surgery. I can't say gamma knife alone because radi uh, leading edge radio surgery can be done with linear accelerator based like cyber knife with, um, you know, pro proton beam could theoretically do this. It's just the nature of whether you, you, you understand the pathways. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I've been doing this 27 years and I still don't understand the pathways perfectly. But in this particular case, this is the tumor before, before looking at the flare sequence. And as you know, remember, it looks like it's just located there. But if we move on, we, we see that, remember that famous part that was out all the, way, all the way out there. 
So if I ignore that, um, we're missing the boat. So I have to treat that area, I've got to treat that area, I've got to treat that area, as I showed you before. Now, how do these tumors get to those areas? Well, I told you they travel down white matter pathways, but edema helps them. So the, the, the edema is making the area rich in their ability to move and float like a little boat, perhaps. So when I treat with gamma knife this particular tumor, this is how I have to treat it, because I got to get that area out here, otherwise I'm missing the whole thing. Uh, this area here was surgically removed. This area here is, is on its way down this way. If I cut it off this way, perhaps those leading edge cells will scar, will die, and then the whole thing self-destructs, okay? That's leading edge radiosurgery. For those of you who don't know what gamma knife looks like, that's the new gamma knife. The concept is that we have 193 beams of radiation that focus to a target point, and I can change the shape of that target point to look like that. The yellow line is a gamma knife treatment plan around a volume in three-dimensional space. So we can target three-dimensionally the, where the pathways of the tumor are going. Now, this gets pretty uh, obvious in a minute. So, you know, I'm not going to go into the research I've done or the paper that we've written, but let's, let's just look at leading edge therapy and, 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 and what the concept is. So the bright white here, this is again a flare. This was the tumor, but remember, you have to treat this area that it's where it's going, and that's the flare positive avid area. And if you miss this area, the tumor is going to continue to migrate. Well, this is that same tumor. I'm showing the T1 where, where they just gave the, the gadolinium, but you can see this dark area, this dark area here, this dark area here, all had tumor in it. And guess what? This location in the brain, this actual location, the white matter tracks only go this way. They only go this way. Once they get into this area, they can go this way, they can go this way, but from here, they can only go in that direction. So you really have a great opportunity to cut this off at the pass if you treat it with a gamma knife treatment plan just like this. And that's what we did. And this patient went on to live 12 years. Now, I will admit that this is a small glioblastoma. So this is a very lucky person. They got diagnosed very early on because they had a seizure. Okay. If you don't have a seizure, this thing, these things can grow to very large sizes without you even knowing them. And, and if you have a seizure, you're in that fortunate category that you might catch this at such an early stage. So this patient lived 12 years after leading edge only plus radiation therapy. I mean, this patient didn't even get Temidar. This was before Temidar was invented. And they finally died of colon cancer. So that looks like an almost a cure, right? Does Dr. Duma say he has the cure? Absolutely not. Please repeat that. I do not have the cure for glioblastoma, but what I do have is an adjunctive treatment option. Here's a great one, okay? This, this is a patient that had this tumor removed, okay? So I removed this large mass right here. This is the hole, the, 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 the void where the tumor was. And the rest of the brain looks pretty good, doesn't it? unless you do the flare, and here it is. Boom. So what you saw before is not all there is. And what you see is that this is now migrated here, and it's already well across to the other side of the brain. So if you're focused on this hole or radiation therapy to get this in six, you know, 60, uh, excuse me, six weeks of treatment, that is, that is not grasping this tumor and, and, and getting rid of it. So this is that same patient, there's the void, and this is now four years after gamma knife leading edge. It is now five years after gamma knife leading edge, and everybody looks at this and they go, oh, but he still, still has tumor. No, this is scar tissue from the radiation. There's nothing growing in there. So that patient went five years with no growth of glioblastoma because we were able to catch it along its leading edge. 
Now here's another case of a small tumor uh, presented with a seizure. So I debulked this, I removed that. This is the scan afterwards. Um, but if you look at the, the abnormal flare, there's really not that much of a leading edge on this. But I still covered where I know it wants to go. Look, it wants to go across this pathway to the other side of the brain. That's called the corpus callosum. So this tumor has a leading edge that's gonna go this way, it's gonna go this way. I told you when it goes out, it goes over. So look at this, down this track down here would love to go. So this is how I treated this, small treatment volume. A 20 minute gamma knife treatment, 20 minute and they go home that afternoon or that morning and they can you know, resume their normal activities that evening. For this treatment alone, this patient went out 40 months, seven and a half years, this is what she looks like. And this is her tumor bed, completely gone. There is this little bit of abnormality here and that's a radiation effect. So it's called treatment related imaging change or trick. I love that name. And it will show up along the, the, the lining of a ventricle, but it's just from the radiation, it's not tumor. She's seven and a half years out and she looks like this, okay? Now, okay, that's a small tumor. How about this one? So this is, this is a tumor and the, these people are not old either. This, you know, the, the older we get with, with glioblastoma, the, 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 the more aggressive the tumors are. These, pe these people were in their early, late 50s, okay? So they had that slight advantage, but this was a large tumor. Okay, so look at all the leading edges of this tumor. Okay, there's a leading edge here, the leading edge here, leading edge there, leading edge there, leading edge going this way, this way, and of course, backward. Okay, so if you pretend to take this out and ignore those leading edges, he won't be here in you know, two years. This is my surgical resection, fantastic. Bravo, Chris. This is a great resection. I mean, you pat yourself on the back. This is actually near his speech area. We had to do some preoperative testing for his speech. Great re re result, but you do the flare after my surgery and you can see the leading edge here, leading edge here, leading edge going back. Remember what I showed you before, it's all still there. So this is his, this is his gamma knife plant. This is the actual gamma knife plant. And this is it here. 20 minute treatment, done in the morning, go home. This is him now, one year follow up. You don't see much of anything there. You see a little spot here. This is now two years. That looks like normal brain, okay? Seven years. A little, remember around the ventricle, you can get that highlighting. We've biopsied that. I just biopsied that about six months ago. It was dead tissue. So this is, that's him at seven years. And that's him today. Both of these patients have given me their permission to show their faces. And you know what? They were part of my tumor um, support group, our brain tumor support group out here in Newport Beach. And they both met and they started dating. So it was a beautiful little love story as well as a let's fight glioblastoma story. So. Both of them are still alive today. They're doing great. And they had the luck that we were able to catch that leading edge. So our, av our average survival, average with leading edge is 38 months. You know what the difference is between average and median. Average averages in everybody. And people who are out seven years, eight years, like these people can skew that average. Median overall survival, just with gamma knife alone, now remember, um, you know, th this includes my group from the very beginning, and I've learned a lot ever since over the last 15, 20 years. But our median survival is 22 months. That's exactly the same as using Optune for two years with, you know, putting that, the Optune on your head, you know, every single day, wearing it for 18 hours. I think Optune is a little higher, 23 months. It doesn't matter. 
I believe that Optune works very well because it also works on migration as well, believe it or not. It works on direct tumor cell kill and it works on migration. If you add a, a leading edge gamma knife treatment, that might make it even better for you. We don't know the exact answer, but the results are quite good. So um, in 9% of the patients, so doctor, this is the, this, I get this a lot. So you're gonna radiate um, a very focused area of my brain. Uh, are you gonna give me side effects? Uh, am I gonna have complications from this? And the answer is possibly. Uh, you know, if your tumor is, is in your speech area, if we don't stop it, you know, yes, your speech will be affected and it'll really, we, we, we haven't done anything. So there is possibility and it's like, it's like real estate, it's location, location, location. If you had what that woman just had, um, she had zero symptoms coming in. Um, uh, this lady, the lady on the right here, that lady had zero symptoms from her tumor. She had a seizure and I could treat that area with abandon and she has had no complications, no, no effects from the gamma knife at all. But if the, uh, the other fella, his was in the speech area, his speech is mildly impaired right now, but he can fully hold on conversation and fully, you know, understand all spoken word uh, and, and be functional. But you know, it is what it is. It's in the speech area. So you have to stop it. If you don't stop it, it will affect the speech, of course. So, so the answer to the question, you know, can you have permanent complications related to this treatment? The answer is yes, but we're trying to push the envelope. And, you know, 6% is not that bad. You compare that to what they would have had without the treatment. And that, that really, you know, tells the story. So I think that if you look at the addition of leading edge, the graph is very self-explanatory, okay? So this is the leading edge statistics in my paper. Now you can see this in what we published. I mean, I 10% of, excuse me, 4% of my patients are out 10 years with glioblastoma. It's, it's unheard of. 10% are out more than seven years. I mean, these are amazing numbers. How about the five-year survival? Uh, we have 16%. And it's, it's just moving that curve is what we're just trying to accomplish here. Now, what's even more interesting is that this works for grade three, of course, as well. Think of what the difference is between grade three and grade four astrocytoma. Grade three is a tumor that is less malignant than grade four. And what makes it less malignant? Oh, it still migrates. And by the way, it turns into a grade four eventually. Uh, it still does this, has the same features, but it just doesn't have necrosis on a, on a slide uh, when the pathologist looks at it. So what necrosis is, is a very rapidly dividing and utilizing energy tumor. Well, grade three is similar. And by the way, as you might imagine, it works on grade two also. Works beautifully on grade two. It almost works like a surgical scalpel. So it, it, there is a, you know, uh, there are many new treatments for this disease, which is fantastic. Um, we have new protocols uh, at every turn. But I mean, it's fascinating to me that some of the new protocols are involving drugs like BCNU or CCNU, that we gave up, gave up 30 years ago because it didn't have any efficacy. But we're trying to use them in different ways again. So this is just another adjunctive use of a tool that we can use that theoretically stops the tumor in its migrating pathway. And I don't know how many of you are hockey fans, but Wayne Gretzky, everybody knows Wayne Gretzky. He figured it out. Don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where it's going, okay? And that's how we have to beat glioblastoma. That's how we have to, uh, you know, use everything we can, every treatments that we've got, adding it all together. Hopefully we can uh, kill this tumor once and for all.
so that's the end of my webinar, and I'm certainly glad to take any questions. And I hope you all understand this fully. I think uh, it's it's it, it, it's it's one of these like light bulb things, you know. Uh, you get you you understand it finally, and you say, "Wow, this is a different concept." And uh, I, I am telling you all to look at the flare sequence on your scans, and you may find something that your doctor hasn't, and then you now are way ahead of the game. Okay. That was very good. Thank you very much. Uh, very enlightening, and it sounds fantastic. Thank you, Al. We have a bunch of questions from the audience, but before I get to that, I had a strange thought myself that I had to get off my chest before I go to the questions. Sure. At um, ASCO this last week, there was three presentations that were pretty interesting. One was Optune plus Avastin did much better than either one alone. And I'm thinking for the reason that you just said, where the Avastin would help cut off the blood supply to the tumor, but it would trigger the invasion, but Optune slows down the invasion, so it Precisely. doesn't trigger. Exactly. That, that, that is why I will allow patients to get Avastin after I do leading edge. I'm thinking the combination of all of them would be good because there was another presentation Absolutely. using Optune during regular radiation and also had much better uh, results. And then there was another one using checkpoint inhibitors before mm -hmm. and after radiation. So in my mind, I'm thinking, put them all together. No uh, question. No question. I will tell you the biggest problem I have, Al. Sure. And this is going to become very obvious. Most experimental trials will, will exclude any other treatments but their own, right? So right. if you've had leading edge, you may be excluded from the clinical trial. And that's a very important thing for your listening audience to understand is that if you go with this leading edge concept, it is a it may exclude you, put you in the exclu exclusionary uh, uh, group for a trial. So be very uh, careful of that. So the problem is we don't get to see the combined effect. Actually, you can, because Avastin, Optune, and the checkpoint inhibitors are all approved drugs uh, treatments. Um, very I true. Very um, true. So not necessarily they can be used. And your oncologist could be, you know, using them off of a clinical trial. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm all good with that. Okay. I want to talk to you after the conference about this. We'll talk about that later. Let's get back to the questions. The number one question, which like three people asked already, is does Medicare cover this? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a Medicare. All insurances cover it. Um, well, I've been doing this forever. And uh, it, it is, uh, it, the treatment of glioblastoma is approved in, with rate for radiation. And this is a form of radiation. It's a boost. Think of it as a radiation boost. Okay. Um, what is enhancement exactly? What does that signify? All right. So when something lights up like a light bulb on a scan, it just means that the blood brain barrier has broken down enough in that area to let this huge molecule of gadolinium in. And what it, it represents blood brain barrier breakdown is, is a simple answer. Whereas the other areas that light up with flare, they show up water content, H2O. So when you have water around a tumor or edema around the tumor, where remember that boat floating down the, 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 the stream, that's what I'm looking for because it's the same stream that the tumors are gonna migrate down. Okay. Um, what happens to the blood vessels that you hit with the gamma knife? Do they like? Great, great question. What happens? So, so we've, you know, we've, I've been doing gamma knife radiosurgery for more than 30 years. Uh, treated uh, probably close to 8,000 patients so far. And we, we've, we've looked at these under the microscope. We've looked at patients treated under the microscope. We take out their tumors. We look at the brain. We've had autopsy specimens, everything we know. And what radiation does, especially radiosurgery, because it's a higher dose of radiation in one shot, is it scars the inside of the arteries and veins it actually thickens the wall of an artery. And like the sludge or the sludge in, in your pipes, in your plumbing, 
building up, building up. So finally, the, 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 the clog in your pipe, that's exactly what happens with, with radiation and blood vessels. It also has, obviously, an anti-tumoral effect. It works on DNA and it works on proteins. So it stops the DNA from being able to multiply and it denatures proteins so they can't maintain the cell's viability. Okay. Um, can any gamma knife center do this leading edge procedure or only certain centers? They will, let me tell you that it, I, I sent around, I did this with Dade Lunsford, um, you know, uh, when I wanted to publish this paper. And this has been one of the problems that the, um, you know, uh, NIH has with getting a trial for this because not everybody can draw the leading edge. It's very subjective, isn't it? It's like, if you show someone a scan mm -hmm. and, they, and they look at it and I, I say, draw the leading edge, draw what you think is where that tumor is going. I did it to 10 institutions, 10 guys who are experts in gamma knife. And so help me out, every one of them drew a different uh, you know, outline. So it, it really is rather subjective, but it, I've created an ability to just take every single slice of the flare, the volume that's outside of the nidus or the enhancing area, everything outside that area per slice is leading edge. So it gives everybody a chance to uh, draw their own leading edge and to treat it, um, but still, it's 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 not uniform. It's very subjective, and a lot of the a lot of the centers are just not doing this. I mean, there are only a few that understand it. That's the group in New York, Doug Konzioka at NYU. He fully understands it. Uh, the group out in Northwell in Long Island, they they understand it, um, but. I'm, I'm telling you that it, it, you, could, you could visit any, uh, the group in Virginia, uh, UVA, uh, they understand it. Uh, so it's getting out there. I, I, I'm getting the word out there, but uh, you, it, it's, it's very subjective and experience matters. Okay. Um, what treatment, what's your protocol now for like a newly diagnosed patient, they come in, uh, what's the order of treatments and uh, the sequence that you normally do. Okay. So, you know, my hospital has become quite a major uh, academic institution, even though it's a private hospital. It's much like Cedars sinai our hospital, Hogue, Hogue Memorial Hospital. It's in Newport Beach. And we are now, we're, we're designated the best hospital in Orange County, and that, that includes the university that's in this same uh, Orange County. Um, we have uh, an affiliation with St. John's, John Wayne Cancer Institute, and we have an affiliation with USC. So we have access to all of their trials and, and we combine all of our clinical trials. So Al, I'll tell you that it's, it becomes a battle in tumor board where I see a gorgeous, perfect case for leading edge radio surgery. And you know, the oncologist wants to use their uh, vaccine trial or they want to use, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, uh, the ADI trial, the rapinicide trial, um, and they want to, they want to, you know, use their, their various clinical trials and gamma knife is excluded. So we talk about it and, you know, finally the, the I'm getting a lot of respect from the oncologist because our patients are living so long. So we're, it's, it's a work in progress, Al, but to answer your question, if I had a gamma knife leading edge amenable tumor, like one of these, the, pro the, the protocol for me, for my own, or for my wife, or my kids, would be um, surgical resection, maximal debulking, safe debulking to, to maintain quality of life, big debulking, 98%, as much as you can get out safely, immediately gamma knife radio surgery to the leading edge, because why wait? The tumor cells are migrating every single day. So get them while they're migrating the slowest, right? Or the, the earliest, not the slowest, but the earliest. So they haven't gotten very far. So you, you, wanna, you wanna hit that marathon, the marathon runners when they're like at the half mile mark, not when they're at the 15 mile mark. You then do involved field radiation therapy six months with Temidar, the STUP treatment. I think that's a great protocol. I'm in very much favor of that. And then wait and watch. You, you do radiate, you do uh, MRIs every two months and we follow things along. And I gotta tell you, 
That protocol alone seems to hold a lot of patients. Now, if, if, if the patient is into Optune and they're into the, the relative inconvenience of using that, I am way in favor of that as well. So ideally, surgical resection, gamma knife leading edge, radiation therapy with Temidar followed by Optune, that is what I'd probably do in myself, but I'd only use Optune for about six months to a year. In fact, right now I'm talking to um, the, the company and uh, we're trying to get a Gamma Knife plus Optune trial. Well, that'd be very nice. Yeah. Uh, see if you could throw in an arm of Gamma Knife, Optune, and Avastin versus Gamma Knife and Optune. <laughs> Fine, no problem. That'd be fun. Um, you mentioned that there's other devices that can do this procedure. So what is your preference of like cyber knife versus gamma knife versus any of the others? Well, I, I'm a gamma knife guy, right? I was gamma, gamma knife trained, but about 18 years ago, the cyber knife came to Newport beach and I could have been, you know, recalcitrant and said, Oh, I have the gamma knife. I'm not going to learn cyber knife. And so what I did was I, I tried to be Switzerland and I learned how to use the cyber knife. And we also have a tomotherapy machine at Hogue, which is linear accelerator based as well, where you can paint radiation. The only difference between Gamma Knife and the Cyber Knife or other Linux systems is the way that they paint the radiation. Um, the radiation is painted much more homogeneously with the Cyber Knife and the Linux based systems. In other words, every part of that target is getting the same dose, pretty much. Whereas with Gamma Knife, the center of what, I, of, of what I draw is getting a much higher dose, almost double what the periphery is getting. And so maybe the large dose in the middle affects those tumor cells more that are migrating. I don't know the answer. What we would need would be a side-by-side -side comparison of the two, and I do both. I mean, I do Cyber Knife and I do Gamma Knife radio surgery, so I'd be delighted to see that trial but that's a, yet another trial. Okay, you mentioned radiation necrosis. How do you treat radiation necrosis and how successful is the treatment? Uh, it, it, you know, over the years, we've learned how to keep that down to a minimum. When I first started leading edge radio surgery, I was giving double the, the amount of radiation I, I was giving, I'm giving now. I'm realizing that the radiation dose doesn't have to be that all high to accomplish what we want to in terms of stopping the migration. But to answer your question, yes, we get radiation necrosis in certain patients and we do pulses of steroid, Decadron. We do, um, uh, we give patients Avastin just for the uh, uh, radio necrosis, works very well. And uh, tincture of time, just wait it out if, if they can wait it out. Now, with severe radiation necrosis, I go in and surgically resect it. And that works beautifully. You go in, you, you take out this volume of dead tissue, you put it under the microscope, it's completely dead tissue. And now that all those histamines and that reaction that occurs around this dead tissue goes away and they don't need Decadron anymore. So all of those various ways of treating it, depending on how severe it is. Okay, um, can you do this for recurrent glioblastomas? Absolutely. And the problem I have, that, that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, it's, we have almost nothing for recurrent glioblastoma. Right. And, but the problem I, come, I run into is that by the time it's recurrent, it's, it's, it's migrated pretty, pretty far and through the brain. So the volume is, I can't treat volumes greater than about 80 cc's. That means nothing to you, but uh, maybe four inches of, of, of length of, of tumor. I can't reach much beyond that safely. Okay, uh, that was the next question was what size? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it depends, you know, it depends on, we're adding up all the nooks and crannies and all the arms of this. We keep it down to 80 cc's and that can be measured beforehand. I just eyeball it. I look at things now and I can say, well, it's too big, it's, it's too advanced. Right. Or the tumors migrated into the brainstem. We can't treat that safely because that brainstem is so critical, a, a, a structure. So yeah, I mean, now people can reach me on my website and send me their scans. There's so many ways to send your scans now over the internet. 
Uh, you can send scans. I, I have a, a physician assistant, a PA, who reads those emails, uh, tells you what you need, um, gets your history, and then tells, uh, um, and then she'll tell them to get the, you know, what scan? We need this scan, we need the latest scan, et cetera, et cetera, and to ship them to us. And then I have a day, two days in the week, where I actually sit down and look at these for free. I'm not doing a Zoom teleconference. We look at this for free, and I quickly look at these cases, and I can tell whether they're good cases for, for leading edge or not. So use the, uh, the web, my webpage, cduma.com, you can just Google my name and you'll see everything about me. And then, uh, you know, you'll see uh, if the tumor is amenable and I'll want your history. I'll want your, you know, what radiation you've had, what chemotherapy you've had, what experimental trials you've been in or are in, uh, et cetera. So uh, it, it's rather quick. We can do turnaround in a week and uh, you'll get some information. Okay. Um what about inoperable tumors, a newly diagnosed inoperable tumor? It may be inoperable, but it may be gamma knife treatable. I treated a, a young lady whose tumor was right in the middle of the thalamus and extending down into her midbrain. And she is out now five years. She's on, the, on Facebook. Go look at my Facebook page and that, you'll see her. That, that's her funny. Family. That's funny because the next question was, can you do a thalamic tumor? <laughs> yeah. We so can. I guess that's yes. Okay. Um, okay. It looks like that's about it for the gamma uh, leading edge question. But there's questions about other treatments at your institution. Can you talk a little bit about the CAR T cell therapies? You know, I I'm not the right person to discuss that. And uh, sure. uh, Santos uh, Kessery or uh, Dr. Carrillo would be the best to speak on. That. Okay. Maybe I'll get them for another uh, meeting. Yeah, Dr. Carrillo or. Korea or, or Kessery would be great. Okay. Um, one is a little slightly off topic, but can you use a gamma knife to treat Parkinson's disease? Boy, um, if you look back in the literature, uh, about 23, four years ago, I wrote the textbook chapter on using the gamma knife to treat a tremor of Parkinson's disease. And the answer is yes. Right now we're using ultrasound, we're using deep brain stimulator wires, things like that. So to treat, uh, to do a, a pallidotomy, uh, to treat the symptoms of stiffness and rigidity, I do not recommend it at all. But we can treat tremor with gamma knife, but I'm a much bigger proponent of deep brain stimulation. That is going uh, like wildfire now. It's fantastic. And I do that. That is my treat. That is one of my specialties. Oh, perfect. That's about it for the questions. Um, thank you very perfect. much. And I just wanted to invite everybody to next week's webinar. Next week's guest speaker will be Dr. Carl Koshman. He's a pediatric neuro-oncologist in the University of Michigan. And he'll be talking about uh, DIPG and diffuse midline gliomas in children. So we'll see you guys next week. And thank you very much. Good luck much. to everybody. Good luck out there treating your tumors. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you, Al.